It is now official. CNN projects that Donald Trump has been elected president, defeating Vice President Kamala Harris. Indiana just voted red again. But what does that mean for your wallet, your home, and our community's future? Let's dive into how these election results could impact Evansville and beyond. Okay. Well, welcome. We have Tim O'Brien and Steve Bartles with us. And I want to thank you guys so much for joining uh, me here on this wonderful Google Meet to kind of tell us about the elections and how does that represent how we turned out, but also how we are basically going to move forward with Indiana coming into the next year and a few years to go for that matter. So Tim, introduce yourself first. Hi, everybody. Uh, Tim O'Brien, state representative for House District 78. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Kara. And it's an honor to represent Southwest Indiana in the state house. And so I represent House District 78. That's the east side of Manberg County, the west side of Ward County, and virtually all of downtown Newburgh. I have the pleasure of serving on House Ways and Means Committee. I'm the vice chair of government regulatory reform, and I'm on financial institutions committee as well. So at the state house i'm focused on promoting good public policy that protects and improves the lives of all hoosiers and i'm looking forward to the discussion yay well welcome thank you you're a busy man no wonder i couldn't get you on for two weeks you, you... <laughs> <laughs> thank you for accommodating us yes yeah i'm sorry about that yeah <laughs> well i was trying to do this right after the elections but that's why we're doing it two weeks but we were close steve why yeah. don't you tell us about yourself and where you're located and how you represent everybody sure uh steve bartels district 74 so i have all of Perry, Spencer, Crawford County as part of Dubois and Orange County. Um, I'm currently on uh, the chairman of Public Safety and Veterans Affairs, which also encompasses Homeland Security, on Courts and Criminal Code. You're just busy County. too. You're all busy. Yes. You're yeah. very involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I really appreciate what's really, as everybody knows, I'm a realtor and you're watching my YouTube channel, so everybody realizes that. But these guys both represent everywhere I work, live, play, and do everything day to day. So I do cross all their regions, which makes this exciting and why I picked on them to be on this, to kind of go into where we're going with the politics of Southern Indiana specifically. And they can talk to the state as well, obviously, since they're uh, around that and know what's going on with that. So let's go in first. The elections Indiana is a red state. It's been a red state for a while. You can talk specifically Southern Indiana, maybe the areas that really were dominated by blue, because there are a few in the state of Indiana. But what does that mean for the state of Indiana, people that are looking to relocate here? Because there are people that are, are in blue states wanting to get out of blue states. And so I just want them to be educated on what we're about, voting as red, but what our policies are backing all that. Tim or Steve, whoever wants to go from there. You want to talk about the general election results of the state, and then we can get into some questions. You know, I think that most people vote with their pocketbooks and based off the overwhelming results, they voted for change. You know, think of everyday reminders like gas prices and grocery prices and just, you know, out of control inflation. Trump decisively won 88 counties in our state. Two counties that I represent, Vandenberg was roughly 55.6 to 43. Warwick was 64.3 to 34.1. Typically, in order to be classified as a competitive race, the margin needs to be within 10 points. And, and we didn't see that anywhere within our region. Obviously, on a national level, popular vote was won, and so was the Electoral College. The numbers truly show if you look at, like with my district, registered Democrats and registered Republicans, the crossover of the vote is just saying, you know, we're not that far apart on a lot of issues, you know, in the community here. People want our border security. They, they want affordable housing. They want our economy, domestic and foreign, to be straightened out. I think people are kind of sick and tired of our debt structure and just that our government is not running nationally like we would run our own homes. And, and I think that it crosses party lines. And that's obviously how it's people vote. We've seen them getting, you know, coming closer yeah. for sure. Well, I also think that people, you know, they vote for the candidate that they most align with their vision, right? And I think if you ask anybody that lives, works, or plays here, they would say that there's a lot of opportunity here. And opportunity is the cornerstone of our great state. It's a promise that every child, regardless of their background, regardless of their zip code, has access to a quality education that prepares them for the future. It's the assurance that any hardworking Hoosier has a chance to secure a good paying job. 
support their family and ultimately achieve the American dream. And it's the belief that any community within our region, whether it's urban or rural, Steve's or mine can truly thrive and prosper. And, you know, again, voting for a community that, or a candidate that aligns with their vision. And I think that's what we saw. Yeah, no, I would 100% agree. I mean, there's so much opportunity in Indiana. I mean, I know there's great states that have beautiful places and great atmosphere of climate and all that good stuff and mountains. But when it's all said and done, I love Indiana. Like it has so much to offer. I moved from North Carolina and I wouldn't go back. And I don't mind visiting, but for cost of living and what you get here and the friendly people and everything that goes around that, you don't find that in other places. And I've lived in other places. So, I mean, I'm sure there's pockets out there. Don't get me wrong, but I'm a little biased, Indiana. <laughs> no, I'm just saying same experience. And I was born and raised in California love to visit but i sure wouldn't want to live there anymore oh no actually we have a big influx for my youtube channel call me from california from illinois i'm getting a little bit of east coast those are the two states i get a lot of calls from is illinois and california so they are definitely migrating this direction the illinois is just crossing the border it's really not that far or different it's they're getting out of the tax structure and just some of the policies that are in place there so yeah not just you know in this region, but in Northwest Indiana, there's so many people moving from you know, the Chicago land area to the region because of the tax structure. We're seeing it even in Southern Indiana, them hopping oh, over. We there. are, we, yeah. Yeah, not as much, but not as much as I'd like to see. I want to see more. <laughs> well, we'll work on that. <laughs> yeah. So I have some questions for you guys. So are you prepared? <laughs> what specific policies would you advocate for to boost economic growth and job creation in Southern Indiana, particularly in rural and under deserved areas. That'll be probably more for Steve than Tim, but Tim still wants you to answer it from the Vandenberg Warg area. I just want to say Republican leadership in the General Assembly and the governor's office have been able to craft a business environment here in Indiana that's been able to, to attract record investments and job opportunities that will continue to propel our economy forward. So for perspective, our state in 2023, we had $28.7 billion in committed capital investment. It was a record year. And again, like I said, for perspective, in Q1 of this year alone, we had 20.68 billion already. So quickly outpacing last year and signaling another record-breaking year of economic development. It's it's the name of the game. We gotta continue to grow. And we talk about specific policy in the last two years, I had the pleasure of co-authoring the largest tax cut in our state history, bringing down the income tax from 3.23% to 2.9, the lowest amongst any state in the nation that actually has an income tax putting more tax dollars back in the pockets of hardworking Hoosiers, just like every single person listening to this podcast. Something else we can do is continue to be a strong advocate, continue to embrace the idea of regionalism and send a message loud and clear to everybody. That Southwest Indiana is open for business. That's something I know Steve and I pride ourselves in doing. Anytime we have an opportunity to do that, you know, another thing that specific to our region is how successful regional cities and regional economic and acceleration and development initiative programs have been for our state, not just our state, but the whole region that we represent. Regional cities and re in Ready 1.0, we had a combined $92 million investment from the state that led to a seriously stunning $1.25 billion return on investment. And that was just Ready 1.0 with regional, so regional 1.0. The region today, this, this most recent investment was Ready 2.0, and we received the maximum again of $45 million. So being supportive of initiatives like this truly jumpstart our region when it comes to economic development and growth and happy to support that moving into the next session. And Southern Indiana is doing a really good job of capturing a lot of that money, aren't they? We yeah. received the maximum amount every single time that there was an award. So, you know, that's a testament to the folks in, at EREP, the folk, you know, the members of the legislature advocating on behalf of our region, keeping us top of mind and not settling for second place. We want to be in first. Watch out Indianapolis. Here we come. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, from a district standpoint, it's it's a unique challenge that I have in my district where I have like a county like Dubois that are always have been low unemployment rates. And then I've got another county that's generally from a economic standpoint, one of the poorest in the state. It's really unique. And there's little things that we're trying to do for economic development. It's like we got a lot of communities that don't have running water. We can't get running water places. We're still hauling water, still have pockets of no cell phone coverage. You know, a lot of people in Indianapolis and the big cities don't even have that. Concept. I know where but, every drop zone is. <laughs> yes, you're, you're a prime example. Apple, right you you know you're just like hey i'll call you back in 10 minutes you know yeah exactly. uh, but, but these things that uh, i think that other districts kind of take for granted that's why i'm up there fighting and say hey look we just need some water lines we need some infrastructure i do have to and, giggle because everywhere has fiber and you'll have fiber before you have water <laughs> yes yes 
You know, that's so one thing we are doing. About fiber. They're doing okay there. <laughs> yeah, and for all the hills we have in southern Indiana, there's very few pockets that you don't get internet, but we don't have water and sewage everywhere yet. But yeah, anyways, no, but those are the kind of things. And, and I think that we have unique challenge in my district with the, a lot of the hills and the forests, federal forests and state forests, where there's not a lot of availability for land. But, you know, the big thing is going to be housing is where do we build these communities so people can come and live? And if there's nobody living here, who would put in a big business? And that's kind of... Yeah. The challenge here but honestly i mean a lot of your areas are doing a good job i mean you look at what no. french lake has done i mean they've done a great job and just for people watching i know spencer dubois and perry they may not understand what some of that is steve's much more rural than tim obviously there is going to be a different viewpoint here because of where they sit and what they represent. So <laughs> just letting everybody know that that is watching. I'm into that too, about the broadband and our districts being different as far as his being more rural than mine. When I survey my constituents, it gets to the point where they're like, why are we investing so much money in broadband? Well, if you live in and you spend most of your time in the Evansville and Newburgh area, and you're not driving to the rural parts of the state, you don't fully realize what we're talking about. There really yeah. is a strong need. And I joke with Steve, every time I drive to this district, I'm reminded of how important it is that we need to continue to invest in these broadband initiatives because there's such a, a large portion of the state where you don't have 5G LTE yep. or even LTE or even 4G in some places. Yeah. And it's so important. You know, there's a stark difference between the broadband quality in my area compared to Steve's. Yeah. Very true. Yep. Next question. Thank you guys. Uh, with rising housing costs and a lack of affordable options, what is your plan to address housing challenges while balancing growth and community preservation? And uh, for everyone that is watching, Tim is a realtor uh, in his past and still is, but just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> Does that mean I get to take this one first as well? Yes. <laughs> well, as you know, and as you just said, I have a background in housing and with that comes a strong understanding of where we're at in the sector and, and why new resources are desperately needed to combat Indiana's housing shortage. And, you know, you know this very well, Kara. We recently established a residential infrastructure loan fund to tackle fiscal barriers to a new housing development with a $75 million appropriation bill that I worked on with uh, Representative Miller and uh, a few others. As we know, one of the biggest inhibitors to development and infrastructure costs our infrastructure costs, costs rather, and with this new RIF program, I think that it really does, you know, find something that addresses the issue. The fund provides low cost infrastructure funding, priority given to communities that have analyzed their housing needs and have a strong emphasis on rural communities. So when we set this fund up, the $75 million fund, we knew that, hey, the rural communities need housing even more so 70 percent of the funds must be used in municipalities with a less uh, of the population of less than 50,000. an estimated deficit of at least 30,000 housing units this is a much needed catalyst to uh, jumpstart new construction yeah. and we're starting to see the benefits of this right now i know there was a groundbreaking in northeast indiana about two weeks ago for one of these new projects. We're gonna have just invited to one in Vincennes area that wouldn't have happened if we the state didn't take action and help basically create inventory. As a realtor, you've heard that a million times. The shortage is real. There was a day age when a, when a home buyer would go work with the realtor and they'd, they'd give them all their criteria and there may be 20, 30 homes in that first data poll, right? Today, it's a lot less than that, isn't it? Yes. So well, and you know, it's interesting, the stats, and this could be where you're saying more rural than like Vandenberg and Warwick. I've been watching the last few months. You're more even or a little down lately, whereas yeah. we're actually over in the county selling, which means they're and the inventory is still low. It means that the, if it does come up, they probably are moving a little bit. They're still slower, like everything's slowing down. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of shocked to see you guys a little bit more down than maybe Spencer Dubois, you know, Steve's area where they're just a little selling more than last year, which is not what I expected to be honest. It usually it's flopped. So that is probably exactly what you're saying is the counties are in need uh, and there's not enough out there for them. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we gotta be careful as we part with local units of government on their covenants restrictions. And so sometimes they you know they want really nice communities and that's great. Sometimes their decisions actually increase the cost of a home. And so making sure there's a balance there. A lot of local units of government are starting to try to use a residential tip. And yep. if it's used correctly, it doesn't really necessarily is negative towards a school corporation. I mean, there's there's a balance there that can be done. The schools are still getting in, getting payments for the state. They can still make money doing this, but you know they got to start somewhere. And, and it starts with a little bit of risk on, on some of these programs. Mike, listen, I, I believe we have one of the most favorable property tax climates in the nation. 
particularly with our property tax claps, uh, caps, rather. And we still were able to take, create programs and products that will help with relief as well. So on this last budget cycle, we had about a hundred million dollars in targeted property tax relief for homeowners and a few things that you may not be aware of, but we did a temporary increase in the supplemental homestead mm-hmm. deduct for 2024 and 2025. Uh, so we'll still see that next year. We were increasing and indexing the income limits for the over 65 property tax exemption to reflect the cost of living. I think that's really important. And then we also had a temporary downward adjustment in the maximum levy and referendum tax collected to help control tax liabilities. You know, you're gonna see some strides being taken uh, to adjust some of those deductions this upcoming cycle as well, particularly with the over 65 exemption. When you see that on a property, Kara, it used to be an assessed value limit of 200,000. I think last session we moved it up to 240, but it's a cliff. It's not something that's tiered. So right now, if there's a retired couple who qualifies for that exemption and at no fault of their own, their property tax assessment goes up 235 to 240. Well, they lose the entire exemption. It could be because a house that was comparable sold down the street and they didn't do anything about it. You know, they, not, they didn't do anything to make that happen. But they lose their entire exemption. So, you know, one of the measures that I'm working on is, is trying to make that less of a more of a tiered system where you still receive that exemption up to the 240. Anything above the 240 would fall off. So there's some common sense solutions that we can provide that would not be such a massive hit to local governments. In addition well, to all I that, love that you said that because a lot of yeah. people come to our state to retire. I mean, yep. really, they do when they leave California or those higher cost of living areas, they come here because they can live on their retirement and be comfortable. And yeah. so that's good that those kind of things are in place. It, it's incredibly important. And, you know, I, I brought up ready before uh, so that the total price tag for the state is five hundred million dollars of that. We received forty five million. But what I want to bring up is because something that has to do with housing. Housing is a major priority in the requested projects. If you look through all the projects that every community puts together and ready, it's somewhere around the 40% mark historically. I mean, that's that's massive. That is massive. Yeah, it's not just- And that would be apartments and housing, a little bit of everything. Yeah, apartments I'm seeing a lot of and a lot of need everywhere, so. Right, and it's it's not just the market saying, telling realtors and telling homeowners and, you know, property owners that are in the market that housing's in need. It's also the communities coming together and saying, hey, you know, 40%, around 40% of these requests are all housing related projects. And because of that, in the last budget, this is the largest state level investment in housing in our state's history. And if that doesn't indicate how much of a priority housing is for us. Like you said, Kara, I mean, we're really going after retirees. I mean, obviously we've uh, yeah. you know, tax exempted, you know, military benefits uh, to move here and stuff. So we we want people to move to Indiana. We're doing everything we can. Yeah, no, I and I do see a lot of the retirees coming from a lot of those blue states, to be honest with you, because they can't afford to live there anymore. They're moving yeah. into the Midwest for sure. Well, that is wonderful as we love housing. Uh, one good thing to point out is you know, a lot of places are starting to drop in their their values and everything, especially if you go to the bigger areas like a Phoenix or, you know, Austin or those kind of places. We really are. We're still up a few percent, guys. So that I think is really a, a great thing for the state of Indiana. I mean, I'm not saying we're not going to fall, but even even if we're even or a few percent above in values from last year, I think that's a win. So that shows a lot about Indiana and just the stability. And we don't have the up and down swings like a lot of states do. Okay, you ready for the next question? There we go. How would you prioritize investments in infrastructure such as roads, bridges, and broadband access? We kind of talked about broadband access to ensure Southern Indiana is well positioned for the future development. Well, obviously, I'd start with water in my district. We'd like to have every home to have running water. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. If you want to go live in the country and off the grid, <laughs> then go to Steve's place. He's going to get you water. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we're going to eventually get you water. No, I, I think that, you know, that's, Part of what we're supposed to do as government official is Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, and I believe that, you know, that bottom tier where it's kind of our responsibility to make sure people have access to food, running water, sewage and shelter, right? And so uh, along with that, when you go to that safety and security portion, like we want to make sure that um, if you're going to move here and you're going to invest here, that your property is secure um, and then you can get those uh, vital physical needs. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of where our priority needs to be. I, you know, we're not necessarily always supposed to get people jobs, but we got to make sure that they have a road to get there on. Um, and yeah. when they leave their home, their their home is secure. And if there's a problem, you know, they, they can get medical attention and, you know, they can count on somebody's going to put their house on if it's on fire. These kind of things are 
kind of our baseline and and, and sometimes we forget that as uh, legislators that we kind of got to go back to roots and say this we need to make sure they're always investing in, in that part and that's why i think and you know that's why i'm really pushing for my district is like look we got to work with the federal government because they're a limiting factor on how we can get water to some of our areas, you know, because they own the land. So the community needs water and has to go through yeah, the land. They don't realize you have a lot of national forests and all that. Yes. Yeah, very yeah. much so. National state forests. So, you know, those kind of things is priority is has always been for me that that baseline of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we just I always try to focus on that with less government involved. <laughs> yeah, and to, and to, to piggyback off Steve, I, yeah, I think we've taken a proactive approach to ensuring Indiana maintains a modern transportation system cohesive infrastructure and a transportation policy, as well as ensuring that Hoosier infrastructure is properly maintained and remains some of the best in the nation. And uh, I say this a lot, we need to maintain our hard earned reputation of being the crossroads of America. And it's vital that we continue to maintain infrastructure that promotes business and travel and continuous economic development. Some notable project in our area is the completion of the entire I-69 corridor, which includes the I-69 Ohio River Bridge crossing which I think is going to have a massive impact on our region. You know, recently yes. we had the groundbreaking for that. And currently the ramps and the approach work is currently underway. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, you must have got a lot of grants. There's road work everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, they say that it's the state's official flower now. It's the construction. Yeah. So we're seeing that pop up everywhere. But So uh, yeah, if you're moving to Evansville, it will go away. But you, there's a lot of construction right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's all in preparation for the massive amount of growth I think is coming to our region. You know, when that bridge is full done and estimate you know, to start the construction of the main bridge part in 2027, I think it's all going to take off. And what we're doing in preparation for that is what they've coined the Lloyd View Project. But that's that's what you're seeing on the Lloyd Expressway right now. It's roughly $150 million in road work on the Lloyd all the way from University Parkway to like right in front of Deaconess and Newburgh. $150 million in, in improvements all in preparation for the growth that's coming. And you know, we've seen some revolutionary types of infrastructure too, like the first of its kind in the state of Indiana, the continuous flow intersection right in front of Deaconess. Have you driven through that yet? Yeah, yeah. It's something you've never seen before in Indiana. No. <laughs> uh, the whole idea is to make that, that road truly what we call it, an expressway. In addition to the major projects, you know, I'm just kind of reminded of what I saw in the press this morning, we just announced another round of community crossing grant programs. Uh, awards. Steve's familiar with these two, but these are uh, grants that can be used for road construction, bridge preservation, intersection development, stuff like that. And NDOT announced, I think, $139 million available funds this round this morning. And one more thing about prioritizing rural communities. This is another one of those programs in the state that we recognize rural areas need this. So 50% of the funds that are in these grants have to be used in rural areas. Again, that's in code, population of 50,000 people or fewer. Just continuing to prioritize rural area. It's a pretty good program. Being supportive of these, I mean, I know we just learned on the last funding for it, but since 2016, more than $1.8 billion has been awarded through crossings. And yeah, I, I plan to continue That's definitely that. an emphasis in the state. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a great program, and we're all hopeful we can keep uh, increasing the uh, the money for that program. So, yeah. Okay, final question. You guys are doing very well. Thank you. <laughs> it's my first podcast. So. Is it really? Yeah. I, mean, I need my... to come visit you more. Yeah, I don't, why would I don't have do a whole this? lot of uh, YouTube videos over in your area. I'm oh, going to come oh, visit. God. Watch out. You, you just got uh, there you go. your dog. You're like, go, go away, Kara. Okay, here we go. The next one. What steps would you take to improve healthcare access and affordability for residents, particularly in rural counties where services are limited? I know that's more Steve. Tim has a wealth of health around his area uh, in regards to hospitals and all that, but maybe you can touch on, you know, just access and affordability in general to the state. Yeah, I think that one of the keys that we probably about 15 years ago, I think the state probably put some money and emphasis on was was clinics uh, in rural areas, but yeah. they kind of focus on dentists, right? And so I think that if we would take that concept and actually have a clinic that was slightly subsidized by local communities and a regional concept, but where you would have a dentist there and you would have a, a PA, you'd have uh, other healthcare professionals. I think that's kind of the key for my district. You know, obviously I've got a county that has no healthcare clinic, no hospital. We've got some issues in Orange County too. I represent part of them. So I think that that's probably one of the things we need to focus on. I know that to look at how do we 
incentivize doctors to come to rural you know areas by student loan repayment programs different interest rates and those kind of things so um, we just got to be open-minded there and, and make it to where there's a draw to these communities. Well, there's I've had doctors looking at coming to Jasper where they're from Cincinnati and, and the pay is way higher. Just, I mean, for them, just to relocate that incentive to yeah. a rural area. So, so I'll piggyback, you know, healthcare costs and access have been a clear forward priority for, you know, the past few years, particularly within the last budget session, representing monumental steps forward in funding local health departments and ensuring that healthcare is as affordable as it possibly can be for all who We put together this Healthcare Cost Oversight Task Force, I think that's what it's called, and all the recommendations were centered around transparency, affordability, barriers to entry, and access. And these are all important things, all things Steve just you know hit on. You know, one of the barriers to entry that I thought was interesting is that some of the physicians that we were trying to move here due to issues with the PLA uh, the professional the licensing agency it was taking them a year to transfer their license to indiana well that's something the legislature can step in and say hey we got we got to make this more efficient right yeah we got to attract and retain more talent not just our state particularly in our our region right that's what we're, we're kind of focused on and can't have any delay in licensure is a delay to healthcare, right so making that more efficient expanding access big for hoosiers especially those who live in rural areas so we've made great strides in improving telehealth, right? So, you know, where you can meet with your physician or your nurse practitioner or whoever you're seeing via things like this, things like Skype or FaceTime or Teams. And then just uh, something that, you know, I'm working on is just improving the, the overall state of medical services throughout the state of Indiana and, and particularly rural areas, right? We mean, Steve, are working on an upcoming EMS roundtable for the state of Indiana. It's going to happen early next month. And I carried a bill this year that did a deep dive into what's the overall state, right? What does the picture look like for emergency medical services throughout Indiana, right? If anybody were to call 911, they should be able to answer these questions. You know, will somebody respond? You hope that's yes. How quick will they respond? How how fast will they get there? Will they be able to provide basic life support or advanced life support? These, all these things matter. And the answer to all of those questions today is it depends on where you live. You know, yeah. you could call 911 on the east side of Evansville. You're probably going to have different answers to those questions when you call 911 somewhere in Steve's district. Right? So I called 911 when I hit a deer in Orange County. <laughs> 2.30 oh in the morning. 20 minutes wasn't bad. Of course, yeah. I was. they knew I hit a deer. It wasn't like life threatening, but still that was fast. I thought for 2.30 in the morning. You know, there's a, there's a balance. I mean, that right. one of my fears is, is the state comes in and starts mandating things. And if, if they're not going to pay for it or help subsidize it, it's kind of tough for several of my communities to, to, to make up that financial difference to provide some services. So there's got to be a balance here. There's got to be working with the local units of government say, hey, you know, how can we help? What access do you need? Like Crawford County, for example, is trying to figure out, you know, going from basic life support to a paramedic service. So what are those costs and how do they recoup some of it? It's never going to be a profit center, but how do you maintain it? You know, the, yeah. the key is we can always stand up a program, but if it's not maintained, it's, it's kind of useless. So those are the things where I think the state's got to come in and provide some help and, and not make things mandatory without funding. Yeah, but all these issues are all related. Healthcare, public safety, it's important to every single Hoosier. And I agree with Steve, the state does need to step in and, and help provide funding for these type of things. But if you're living in these, in these areas and you're living in the state, you ensure that on your worst day, the best respond. Yeah. And Do you time, know how we time, compare time. around our states with healthcare? Because I know a lot of people talk about healthcare costs among the states too. I guess that's more related to insurance though, isn't it? I just feel like that I hear people will get insured in Kentucky. It went up or down. You know, I didn't know if you guys knew anything about that. I'm not an expert at that part, so I don't know. I think Tim would agree that we're not leading in the uh, savings of healthcare costs in the state of Indiana. I think we definitely know we can do better and we're trying to figure out those solutions. But okay. I do, obviously our costs are a little higher than our neighbors. Okay. Well, and it's, and it's evident why our one of our priorities is to make healthcare as affordable as humanly possible for all Hoosiers. So, well, anything that I missed that you guys want to add specifically about what you're trying to work on, maybe uh, any projects that is <laughs> in your your heart, because Tim has a lot of projects in his heart. <laughs> I do. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, I know I mean, you do. <laughs> you know, my anything main focus. Well, I don't think so. I, I think my, my main focus has always been how do we limit, you know, state government? I think we've continuously increased and I want to be able to change that and say, you know, 
People don't mind to be governed, but they don't want overburdensome regulation. They don't want the regulations to change based on who's coming out to do inspections when it comes to you know, the housing issue. Yeah. They want timely response. So we're working on those, how we can reduce government, make it more efficient. And that's kind of been my goal ever since doing this. So. Tim, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I could talk for, how much time do we have? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I you have as much as time as until you want to get no, off. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say, I mean, like I said at the beginning, I'm focused on good public policy that protects and improves the lives of all Hoosiers. And I honestly think if we keep that our North Star, we'll be okay. And we've got an upcoming session about to start next few weeks, gonna be a very tight budget year, lots of topics coming up, but I'm really optimistic about how we're gonna end up. I feel like we're gonna be in a good spot. I would just encourage anybody that lives in our region to reach out to Steve and I and share your thoughts and concerns with, if you see a piece of legislation or if you have an idea for some type of legislation, let us know. If something's working out well, let us know that too. We're a, a very lucky region in the sense of we've got delegation that all works together very well and easy to get a hold of. As a realtor, my cell phone number's on benches and stuff around the, around the You can find me. I don't have benches. You can't hide. Benches, and the same thing Yours might be on a winery. Yeah, that's right. That's right, we're, we're accessible. And uh, it's all about serving Hoosiers and, and ensuring that uh, Indiana remains a competitive place, a great place to live and work and, and seriously raise a family. And uh, we're happy to continue to advocate on its behalf. We need our constituents to be engaged, right? I mean, so we send out surveys and I don't know how many times I've voted off those surveys and I would not personally have voted for that. But, you know, it's like 78 percent of my, my district wanted that. So. I don't think people realize that there's people like Tim and I that really we, we count listen. on their response. Yes, we listen. And there's times I'll just quickly as like when the, everybody in my district wanted the smoking age raise, you know, as a military guy, I was like, that's the one thing I got to do when I was 18 was be able to chew and smoke, you know, and everybody wanted to raise. And I, I, I would have never personally voted for that. But when I had seven, eight percent, my survey came back and said, we want to do that. That's how I voted. We need everybody to be engaged, you know, whether in our district or not, engage with your, your representative. Well, very good. Well, I really, really appreciate everybody's time. Very informative. I get to see you in passing. Not enough as compared to what I used to, but you're busy yeah. guys. So I do appreciate your time. And if you are relocating to the area and have questions with our politics and our po local politicians, feel free to reach out. I can ask them any questions if you have something specific you want answered. But other than that, you've got great representation here, guys, if you are watching. And if you're relocating, you're in good hands. So. I appreciate Thanks, you guys. You have a great day and I'll see you somewhere on the streets somewhere, right? <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, Thanks so much. Happy yes, Thanksgiving. Yes, you happy Thanksgiving, Thanks. guys. Bye. 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 We open doors in realty. Key Associates. Key Associates.